Hello and welcome to this OncLive Peer Exchange, Expanding Treatment Options for HER2 Positive Breast Cancer. I am Dr. Adam Brusky from the UPMC Hillman Cancer Center, and joining me today in this virtual discussion are my colleagues, Dr. Carrie Anders from the Duke Cancer Institute in Durham, North Carolina, Dr. Virginia Kaklamani from UT Health in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Rashmi Murthy from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, and finally, Dr. Mark Pegram from the Stanford Cancer Center in California. Today, we're going to highlight a number of topics pertaining to the systemic treatment for HER2 positive breast cancer and the impact of recent clinical trials data on clinical decision making. In addition, we'll be covering key data from the ASCO 2020 annual meeting. Let's get started on our first topic. Before we even get started, is there still debate about HER2? I mean, you know, how to test for it. Or is that kind of settled? Mark, what do you think? Are we done? Do we have it finally? Are the ASCO cap guidelines it? Are there any nuances we should think about? You know, sadly, the ASCO cap uh, guidelines has been a work in progress, and there have been multiple revisions, the most recent of which was 2018. And that revision, they made a few major changes. One is just the definition for IHC 2 plus, the equivocal IHC zone. Uh, they now say that HER2 testing on the surgical specimen is no longer mandatory if you've already done it on the core biopsy. Um, there is more rigorous interpretation criteria now for the gray zones, that is copy numbers of HER2 between four and six, and ratios around two. There's a much more defined workflow in the pathology lab to work those up. And then finally, the expert panel for ASCOCAP also recommended the use of dual color uh, fish probes rather than ish. Uh, which does not have a control probe for chromosome 17. So those are the major changes with ASCO CAP 2018. So the question is though, right, so here I had a patient, I'll give you a perfect example. I'll hear what you guys have to say. Woman comes in, you know, she's got, she comes in probably like a four centimeter tumor in her breast and it's like ER5, you know, PR0. It looks kind of triple negative-ish. And she's, and the KI is like 50. And so we do a HER2 on her, and it comes back at a ratio of 1.97 with a copy number of like 4.2, you know? So what do we do? Virginia, what would you do in your institution if that came up to you? We get this every day, so really that's the question I'm asking. We do, and I don't know that I know the answer. I, I always look at what the clinical trials have done and, and what patients have been included. Uh, and, and this, again, is hard because you have the central testing and then you have the local laboratory testing and results being different between the two. Typically, I'd rather err on the, 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 the side of giving anti-HER2 therapy than not giving it. But, but it's really where we, we still need some data as to what to do. It's not black or white. MD, what do you think? Yeah, many ahead. of these cases that are always on the fence like this, oftentimes if you send the sample to an academic reference lab to really study the, the case in detail, what you'll find is examples of intratumoral heterogeneity. And this was pointed out last year in the uh, HER2 ASCO session in 2019. I was the discussant in that section. And it showed that in upwards of 10% of the time, there can be heterogeneity. So you can have admixtures of both truly HER2 positive and truly HER2 negative clones in the same primary tumor. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, it's very important there, this, this heterogeneity can both be geographic. So getting multiple samples of the same tumor is an advantage in that respect. And it also can be temporal. You can see that through selection pre pressure of HER2 targeted therapies, there can be outgrowth of HER2 negative clones, for instance. So that can be temporal. You'll find that change in the metastasis compared to the primary, but at the time of diagnosis, unless you do multiple sampling and analyze it carefully, you may miss it. So, you know, so what we do at our center to try to get around that is I think we have our guys count the most intense HER2 positive portion of the specimen. That's what we do. Reshmi, do you do that at MD Anderson? The guys do it there, Fraser Simmons and those guys? What do they do? Yeah, so we um, sometimes count more cells if we get an equivocal uh, result like that. But I, I echo what's been said before. You know, I would probably verge on the side of treating or offering treatment um, in some of these equivocal cases just because of the impact that um, HER2 targeted therapy has had. Option sometimes is to get another biopsy sample um, to see if, um, you know, a, a different part of the tumor has a different result. So that's another option um, to re-biopsy and recheck the HER2. Yeah. So another, Karen, another, I mean, that's another clinical, another clinical um, pearl, if you will, is like, I like to call it, if it walks like a duck theory. Right. And that is, 
pathologic alteration of HER2 is clinically and statistically significantly associated with higher T stage, positive lymph nodes, high grade, decreased or absent steroid receptor expression, high KI67, and non-lobular histology, with the exception of pleomorphic lobular, can rarely be HER2 amplified. So if you have characteristics that fit all of those or many of those criteria, and it's a true indeterminate you know, gray area case, you're probably gonna err on the side of treatment as was mentioned earlier. If it doesn't have any of these features, uh, then I would say that, you know, probably. Yeah, and Mark, I cannot agree with you more. This is a really important point, the audience, for our audience listening to this, is that, you know, you'll, you, someone will come in and they'll look, they'll have a HER2 of like 1.8 or something like that, a ratio of 1.85, and you'll treat them like a triple negative. And just like, remember, there are, got, there are people on this call that remember these days of before we, we had trastuzumab, and we would treat people, nothing would happen. And that's what happens. You got these people coming with these incredibly horrible, you know, very aggressive, look like triple negative-ish disease. And then you treat them and nothing happens to them. And you like scratch your head, like what the hell's going on here? And you put them on Pembro and all this other stuff. When in reality, you got to be very careful. I, I cannot, I don't know. What do you guys, Carrie, what do you guys think of this? I mean, you know, I think it's a really good point Mark is raising here. So I think the other piece of the ASCO guideline updates in 2018 is if you have a grade three, just like you're saying this, you know, if it's it's appearing like it is a very aggressive ER negative tumor to repeat the HER2 on the surgical specimen, even if the core biopsy was negative. So I think that gives you that second point in time to really, like you're saying, ensure that we're not missing the opportunity for this patient to benefit from HER2 directed therapy. But what happens if you have someone who comes in and say on the core, the HER2, again, you know, it's a two plus and the ratio is like 1.8-ish, 1.85, and you do it, you give her a neoadjuvant chemo and nothing happens because you're not giving her anti-HER2 therapy. What do you do then? You know, you just give her adjuvant trastuzumab when you find out? I mean, you, you get could, a, you read you past, could test absolutely. residual disease, yeah. right? You could test yeah. the residual disease and see if a HER2 positive clone emerges. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right, cool. I mean, that's kind of the issue. And so there's a heterogeneity issue, I think we really need to emphasize to people. And there's this whole concept that if it walks like a duck, it's a duck. I think those are important. Anything else that we missed in this part, guys? That we I mean, seeing is believing. You know, have your pathologist show you the data at tumor board. I can't tell you how helpful <laughs> that is. You know, you, when you see immunostains that are, you know, three plus and not, uh, seeing is believing. And I've seen uh, our own pathologists have to issue you know, retractions to their original report, sometimes uh, uh, posted by a trainee, indeed, um, when, when the whole group gets to see it in, in the light of day. No, I've, been, I've, tortured our, I've tortured our tumor board for years on this very topic, you know, especially when it gets to amplification, and they go, it's negative. And I say, guys, how many cells do you count, you know? And I make them put it up. I make them show me what they did, and so they go, oh, yeah, maybe we should count some more in this section. You know, I mean, again, remember, our audience may not have the access to tumor boards that we all do, so... But you there's nothing wrong with a second pathology opinion. You can yeah. send the sample to Mike Press's lab in Los Angeles like I do. And if there's something really nuanced, he'll call you on the telephone to explain it to you. I remember the first time he called me when there was a allelic loss of the chromosome 17 control probe. He said, be careful. The ratio is going to be high, but it's not due to your gene amplification. It's the lesion of one of the control probes. And that's super helpful when you get that kind of, uh, when you get that kind of uh, feedback. 